thank you for joining us today. I'm very honored to be your moderator for this program. My name is Howard Ovens. I'm an emergency physician and the chief medical strategy officer here at Sinai Health in Toronto. But I'm also the son of a Holocaust survivor. My late father, Sam, was born in 1919 in Zolishitz, Poland, a small town near Krakow. When the war broke out, he was 19, a good age for doing hard labor. He spent time in several camps, including Plashoff, the camp where Oskar Schindler famously aided his workers and where the infamous and sadistic camp commandant, Eamon Gotha, uh, happened to uh, shoot my father's brother without provocation in order to instill fear in the other arriving prisoners. This event was witnessed by a survivor who was a friend of my father's and repeated by him to me. My father also spent time in Gross Rosen and was liberated from Ebensey, which was part of the Mauthausen complex of camps. I never felt burdened by my father's history. Rather, it instilled in me a strong capacity for resilience grounded on an appreciation of the many blessings we enjoy living in peace and prosperity in Canada, but also a sense that things change and a respect for the importance of politics and world events in our individual daily lives. And thus, I am particularly honored to be your moderator today. The program will talk about Jewish medicine in the Holocaust and is part of our recognition of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. This program is being recorded. And for those of you who wish to see uh, the or share the link, it will be provided to you by email uh, that you use to register and will be up on the participating organizations websites later today. We hope to have time to take some of your questions. You can put your questions uh, directed to Melissa Michael, our host, in the chat box. And at the end of the speaker's presentations, we will turn to your questions. In 2005, the United Nations passed a resolution designating today, January 27th, as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. On that day in 1945, 77 years ago, the Soviet army liberated the Nazi concentration and extermination camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau. This day was designated a commemorative day in memory of the 6 million Jewish men, women, and children murdered in the Holocaust that included my grandparents and uncles, along with the millions of other victims of Nazism. It was also created to support the development of educational programs like this one about the Holocaust as a means of preventing future genocidal events. Most of us are aware of Nazi medicine, including the mad experiments of Dr. Joseph Mengele. This was a broad corruption of the physicians of the time who collaborated with the regime, but less well known is today's story about how Jewish medicine was practiced in the ghettos and the camps, and it forms a story of resistance to the Holocaust. It stands in stark contrast to the Nazi medicine being practiced at that time, which was medicine in the self-interest of the physicians and which was aimed to hurt and harm their patients versus Jewish medicine, which was uh, practiced at tremendous self-sacrifice and risk and was aiming to help and heal even under the most dire of circumstances. Our discussion today is particularly timely as it comes at a time when the voices of those who survived are sadly dwindling, when international anti-Semitism is growing, and will help us understand why contemporary COVID comparisons to the Holocaust are inherently wrong, a form of Holocaust distortion, which seems to be replacing in many ways, Holocaust denial. Our speakers today come to us from both Israel and the United States. Our first speaker is Dr. Miriam Offer, who is a senior lecturer at the Western Galilee College and teaches the history of medicine during the Holocaust in the Sackler Faculty of Medicine in Tel Aviv University. 
She is an expert researcher on Jewish medical activity during the Holocaust, a topic on which she has published uh, numerous journal articles, and most recently, the English edition of her very fine book, White Coats in the Ghetto, Jewish Medicine in Poland During the Holocaust. It's published by Yad, Yad Vashem, and I highly recommend it to all of you. Dr. Offer was also a member of the Lancet Commission on Medicine in the Holocaust. She's also head of a research team on medicine, morbidity, and childhood during and after the Holocaust. Miriam, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you on International Holocaust Remembrance Day. I feel privileged to take part in a discussion that is being held today at the same time all over the world. Solidarity with all those who wish to remember and to commemorate, to research and to learn, to think about the relevance for today and to try to ensure a better future. I'm especially delighted with the opportunity to hold the session with Menachem Varshevsky. There is no substitute for Holocaust survivors' testimonies. Thank you, Menachem. Who is next? She has to speak. Who? I? Yes. Jewish Medicine, the Hall of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. The research on Jewish medicine in the Holocaust shows that in most of the large and medium sized ghettos in the different areas under Nazi occupation, the Jews established impressive professional medical systems under impossible conditions, which was an unprecedented phenomenon. In 1993, I had the privilege to discover the diary of Dr. Aaron Pick from the Shavli Ghetto in Lithuania, in which he described important medical aspects of life in the ghetto, including tragic ethical dilemmas. Pick described this in his diary. The only place was a morgue in the cemetery. The room with a cement floor was very cold during this last winter, which was particularly chilly. There was no equipment, furniture, or bricks, but the necessity, the initiative, the generosity of spirit, the adjustment, the courage of the Jewish council overcome all the obstacles. And in a short space of time, the morgue and the rooms that had served the Hebrew Kadisha were turned into a hospital, very small, but under the present conditions, quite splendid and proper. Peak Peak brings the important insight that the establishment of a hospital in the ghetto cemetery is a unique phenomenon in itself, which shows initiative, forbearance, the ability to overcome the obstacles, to protecting the health which the Nazis imposed on the ghetto Jews. The study of the Jewish medicine during the Holocaust indeed began within the ghettos. The pioneer researchers were the ghetto physicians who studied morbidity and the outbreaks of epidemics from which they themselves were suffering. Immediately after the war in 1945 and in the next two decades, physicians and a small number of historians showed tremendous interest in the field. One of the main researchers was physician turned historian, Dr. Mark Dworzewski. After his death, the study of Jewish medicine in the Holocaust underwent a slowdown period because the focus of Holocaust research had shifted to other aspects. The last two decades have seen a new wave of research the study of Jewish medicine is unique to Holocaust research. In genocide research, 
the issue of medical system in the per persecuted society is non-existent. Most studies focus on post-traumatic morbidity following the event. However, the study of Jewish medicine points to the establishment of an independent Jewish medical system with modern professional characteristics by the persecuted victims themselves. It is no coincidence that no documentation exists about internal medical organization in other cases of genocide. It seems that in these cases, no medical organization which resembles that of the Jewish ghettos was created. And this is therefore not reflected in the research. It must be noted, however, that similar to persecuted groups in other cases of genocide and mass atrocities, the ghetto Jews were also a segregated society subject to difficult living conditions that led to poor sanitation and disease. The Jews in the ghettos had to deal with genocide conditions, crowding, poor sanitation, hunger, loss of livelihood, the cold, hot of refugees, and forced labor. Thousands of Jews perished in the ghettos as a result, long before the start of the systematic extermination of the final solution. Many testimonies about illness and health remained behind in the ghetto. The medical staff documented, researched, and memorialized these events, painting a picture of the medical catastrophe imposed on the Jews. A testimony by a nurse in the children's hospital in the Warsaw ghetto described this as follows. My duty is from three until 11. When I come to my ward, it's a real hell. Children sick with measles lie in twos and threes to a bed, shaved little heads covered with lice. Pressure of work drives us crazy. What first? Distribute medicines, give injections, serve food, redo dressing on the heads to keep off lice. I have no bed, no linen, no blanket, no sheets. Under the difficult conditions, the physicians who themselves were suffering from hunger and all the other troubles in the ghetto continue to maintain a professional health care routine, rotating shifts, diagnosis, treatments, doctor's visit, interviews, training, and conferences in the hospital. In addition, the physicians were confronted with ethical issues, tragic dilemmas, especially during the actions in the ghetto. Dr. Mark Balin, who worked in the hospital, described how he and other physicians had to decide which patients would be sent from the hospital to the Umschlagplatz. This panel of three prominent physicians had to make the judgment. They had a list of patients' names in front of them. Alongside each name, a plus sign meant deportation or death, while a minus sign meant to remain in the hospital. The doctors stop at each bed for a longer time than usual. They whispered quietly, in anguished voices. They debated in Latin so the patients could not guess anything or comprehend the horror of this unusual contemplation. Certainly, the medical organizational and professional challenges that confronted the medical staff do not arise under normal conditions but only among other persecuted populations in, in, in situations of genocide or ethnic cleansing. Even though every such persecuted group is different, in all other cases, the medical system collapsed. And if any services at all were provided, they relied mainly 
on the external assistance of international organizations. It was specifically under these conditions in the Jewish ghettos, however, that the medical staff and ghetto leaders initiatives and the activities were so conspicuous. Under these difficult conditions, professional medical and healthcare system were established in the different ghettos, setting themselves public health challenges according to modern perceptions, which included treating sanitation, immunization, quarantine for infectious disease, etc. This system dealt with emergency medicine and treating patients alongside academic studies, in-service training, and medical research. This was established by the Jews themselves, by the persecuted society, neither by the Germans nor by any other external authority. Examples of this were found in many of the ghettos, including the Barca ghetto. This slide presents an overall picture of the medical system established in the Warsaw Ghetto. Please focus on the whole picture rather than on the individual details. Note the all-encompassing organization of a professional system which try to prevent disease and contain epidemics, to provide assistance and treatment to patients and to maintain an ongoing medical infrastructure of research, academic study, and training. Adam Chernyakov, head of the Judenrat, was, the, was at the forefront of all these activities, establishing healthcare and medical treatment departments, mainly the healthcare department, which runs six health centers in the ghetto, two hospitals, and regional clinics. Professional committees were established in parallel, such as the Health Council, an organization to fight tuberculosis, a medical service for refugees, and more. The, work, the workers of the Jew, Judenrat and of uh, the TOS Jewish Health Organization, which operating during the interwar period, sheltered most of the burden of running this system. In this slide, you can see the main institutions that functioned as part of the ghetto's medical service, services, including the Chista Jewish Hospital, which was an important medical institution that served the Jewish population in Poland between the two world wars. It was not situated within the ghetto boundaries, but the Jews used their initiative and reconstructed the hospital in, in buildings scattered around the ghetto. The Berson and Bauman Jewish Children's Hospital was located inside the ghetto, but was forced to move from place to place throughout the ghetto period. There was an extensive network of clinics in the chemical and bacterial labs set up by scientists in the ghetto. There was a first aid station and 19 pharmacies. Institutes for the study of medicine and nursing were established, where research projects were conducted according to high academic standards. There was a school of nursing, which had approximately 80 students during the ghetto period. A calendistic faculty of medicine provided preclinical and clinical studies for junior and senior medical students. Approximately 500 novice medical students were taught by senior physicians and scientists to high academic standards. Worthy of mention in the research field is the underground study of hunger disease, a syndrome that afflicted all the ghetto inmates and caused thousands of deaths. The study was carried out by about 30 physicians. Large parts of the research survived and it is still held in high esteem by the medical research population today, some 70 years later. TOS was Jewish health organization founded by Jews in the interwar period to serve the three and a half million Jews of Poland and it continued to operate in the ghetto. In addition, 
together with the Juden rats, it provided medical aid to refugees, to children in the ghetto and needy ghetto inmates, as well as dealing with preventive medicine to combat epidemics. Here, we must mention the outstanding physician, Dr. Sarah Zofia Sirkin Binstein, who was in charge of the fight against epidemics among the 150,000 Jewish refugees in the ghetto. The organization not only provided medical services to half a million inmates of the Warsaw Ghetto, but also sent assistance to toss branches in dozens of other ghetto south throughout the general government. In reality, it was a kind of Jewish medical network that provided medical assistance to the Jews of the ghettos. Dr. Israel Melikovsky, a, dermat a dermatologist who was head of the Jewish Medical Association in the interwar period, was director of the health department in the Warsaw Ghetto. He was responsible for the entire medical system described thus far, was devoted to the ghetto population and filled his role at great personal risk. During the great action to Treblinka, he hid in the Jewish cemetery and wrote an introduction to the Anger study, which had been his own initiative. His writings reflect the motivation behind such activities in the ghetto, preserving the human spirit, scientific perpetuation of Nazi crimes, memorializing the positions as well as the tens of thousands of anger victims. I have never felt it strongly as now when I have to write an introduction to this work. The subject of our study is the usual day-to-day -day anger, anger in the physical sense. We are honored to encase this subject in a scientific problem to satisfy our hunger for science and to gain knowledge at the expense of our physical hunger. If the discussion is from an historical viewpoint, then this is truly the unfinished symphony of Jewish physician from 1942. Milikovsky saw such reaction patterns initiated by the Jews in the ghettos as the only answer to murderers. A last few words to honor you, the Jewish doctors. What can I tell you, my beloved colleagues, and companions in misery. You are a part of all of us, slavery, hunger, deportation, those death figures in our ghetto were also your fate. And you, by your work, could give the henchmen the answer. Nan omnis moriar, I shall not holily die. In another important document, he described life in the ghetto from his own perspective. Among other things, this demonstrates his sense of mission and how he trans transcended above the differences of opinion that characterized the Jewish society during the interwar period and in the ghetto. An example of this is what he wrote about the physicians in the ghetto who had converted to Christianity. I understand the soul and disposition of the convert who was brutally cast into the ghetto with us. The Talmud says that even if a Jew sins, he is still a Jew. And there my conscience dictated to adhere firmly to the Jewish ethical prescription. You shall neither avenge nor bear grudge. In our ethical development, we stand high above pity account settling with brother sinners and particularly in times of trouble. Milikovsky's spirit succeeded in uniting the various personalities who made the contribution and led the medical system in the ghetto. Women and men, 
convert, bundist, Zionist, and assimilated Jews. Several prominent figures will be mentioned here. Dr. Anna Baudeller, director of the Children's Hospital, was a member of the Bund. Dr. Melikovsky, director of the health care system, was an avid Zionist. Dr. Saria, Sarah Sophia Sirkin Binstein, together with him, directed the health department of the ghetto. Professor Hirschfeld, the famous scientist in bacteriology and serology, was a Jew who had converted to Christianity. Adam Cherniakov, head of the Judenrat, who cooperated with all the calendistic and other medical activities and was considered as a simulated Jew. Professor Julius Zwiebom, who was head of the underground medical school and the nurse Luba Bielitska Blum, who ran the nursing school in the ghetto and was a member of the Bund. This unique phenomenon of establishing professional medical systems based on modern perceptions in the ghetto could be seen in all the large and medium-sized ghettos. A glance at the medical system in the ghettos raises several insights. One, the Jewish society in the ghettos under the Nazi regime, despite being victims of persecution, coped independently with the medical catastrophe imposed upon them by establishing a professional medical system which adopted public health principles. Public health policy grew out of the development of the modern state starting from the 18th century, which was perceived as responsible for public health by the dis distribution of public treatment systems, medical institutions, preventive treatments, medical training, and research. The scope of development of public health system in a particular society is an indicator of the scope of its general advancement. In light of the medical system in the ghettos, it can be said that the Jews in the ghettos presented a collective reaction pattern of an unmistakably modern society. Despite the crisis and the trauma involved in the reality of life in the ghettos, and despite the medical catastrophe imposed upon them, as a collective, the Jewish society in the ghetto was characterized by continuity from the pre-Holocaust period to life in the ghetto. The Jewish medical infrastructure that developed mainly in the interwar period was what enabled the Jews to rapidly establish a professional medical system immediately on entering the ghettos. During the interwar period, the Jewish physicians and medical institutions had been at the forefront of modern medicine. This was particularly prominent among the Jews of Poland who made up the largest concentration of Jews in Europe. Following the secularization of Jewish society in Poland, students flocked to the secular institutes which accelerated the academization of medicine alongside the age-old tradition of the medical profession among Jews. Thus, for example, in 1931, Poland had approximately 4,500 Jewish physicians, which was 56% of all independent physicians in the country. On the other end, the anti-Semitic Polish nationalism, which had little patience for minorities, led many Jews to study medicine outside Poland, who brought advanced medical knowledge back to Poland on their return. The rejection of Jewish physicians from governmental institutions led to need for separate Jewish medical services. All this led to the establishment of a Jewish national ethnic medical system with a state-like infrastructure. In the interwar period, the first Jewish medical organization established a medical system that served 
the country's entire Jewish population. Note, for example, that Poland had 47 active Jewish hospitals. The medical institutions and organizations in the interwar period developed in every Jewish society in Europe and the United States and large Jewish health organizations were established at the beginning of the 20th century. Despite all this effort, many people perished in the ghettos from disease and epidemics under the terrible conditions. What motivated the Judenrat and the physicians to continue working to save patients who were condemned to search and death? It seems that beyond the basic human need to live as long as one is still breathing, up to the start of the deportation, the ghetto inmates observed only gradual but not total extermination. They hoped that many people would still survive, and it was therefore logical to continue to provide medical treatment. In addition, it seems that the medical system is in the ghettos indicates that traditional Jewish values motivated the Jewish behavioral patterns. The sanctity of life and the saving of life, which are supreme value in Jewish tradition, were one of the reasons for the Jewish prominent position as physicians for 2,000 years, and they were also the foundation for the establishment of the medical system in the ghettos. In conclusion, the Jewish medical system in the Holocaust points to unique phenomenon, the well-known historian Dr. Emanuel Ringelblum wrote these words before he died. We previously mentioned the passive and quiet heroism of the educators, beginning with Dr. Korchak. The doctors and nurses at the Jewish hospital comported themselves similarly. A group of a, Jew da of a few thousand doctors and nurses did not abandon the patients until the last moment. When that tragic moment came and more than 1,000 sick people were loaded into the trains, a handful of doctors and nurses went with them. Such was the behavior of the people whom the Nazis demanded subhuman. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> Miriam, thank you so much for that uh, uh, presentation. It's a truly uh, amazing story of some remarkable individuals who in the most dire of circumstances uh, chose to place their suffering and experience within an ethical and scientific framework in service of their community. And the work that you do placing um, the documentation within an academic and rigorous framework really continues their work, honors it, and perhaps we could even say uh, helps to finish the sym symphony of Dr. Mikulowski. So thank you so much for that. Um, one of the pleasures of this role has been to get to meet our next speaker. Menachem Warshawski has asked me to call him Mickey. He was born in Poland. He was sent, excuse me, he was sent to Auschwitz as a young teen. After being severely injured on a work detail by an SS guard, he was operated on in what was originally a broom storage area at the end of his barrack. With this serious injury and limited time to recover, he was certain that he would be sent back to the crematoria to die. However, he was the recipient of an unexpected kindness from someone he refers to as the holy man of Auschwitz. This kindness, along with his move to work in the prison infirmary, saved his life. Following the war, he um, fought in the independence war in Israel, later lived in Edmonton, Alberta, then moved to New York, and is enjoying a deserved retirement today in Delray Beach, Florida, where he joins us. Mickey, thank you so much for joining us today and bringing a personal note to our discussion. 
start by telling us a little bit about who you were um, at the time the war broke out and how you came to find yourself in Auschwitz. Well, just to make it short, uh, within seven days of when the, of the German crossing the Polish border, we found them in Lodge. My father was originally from Lodge and we lived in Pabianis. Pabianis was connected to Lodge with the Pabianis was, shouldn't stop it. Phones will ring at the most difficult times. Don't of worry, course. Mickey. It's fine. Uh, Pabianisi was connected to Lodge with the electric tramway, uh, a trolley car of a sort. And uh, my so sometimes we spent Saturdays in Lodge with father's family. And this was the Saturday when the Germans walked into Lodge. Uh, I went before father because I had some friends there in the synagogue. And sometimes even behind the synagogue was, we used to play soccer, even though it was Shabbat, we didn't have a ball, but the stuffed sock was good enough to kick around. But I didn't get to the synagogue on the way I saw a Orthodox Jew dressed in Shabbat best, laying on the sidewalk with a hole in his head, was shot the right there, and two black dressed in uniform SS people standing behind him. One took his kind of a Jewish cap that dipped it in blood and he wrote on the sidewalk. J-U-D-E, Jude, and this made it legal. The command, commander of that group came out and he said, oh, don't make an issue out of it. The boys were drunk and you were looking for some fun. I was then nine years old. I ran back home when I asked father not to come to synagogue. This was the beginning of the war. That's how I was introduced to the Germans. Soon after, before the end of 39, which was I think December in 39, we were, had to go to the ghetto. We had a big family. We were nine people at least, father, mother, is two, four siblings, two sisters and a younger brother, grandmother, and a cousin whose mother died at birth was brought up in our home, and an aunt who lost her husband and her daughter lived in our, so we were a big family. We managed to get one room in Pabianit's ghetto. I don't know how many people there were there, but 15, maybe 20,000, because they assembled people from small, small communities and just shoved into Pabianit's ghetto. Uh, Father was in the Polish army when he was young, and he uh, ended up to be a medic. Uh, uh, matter of fact, he assisted in the operatory, and uh, he advanced somehow in his profession or in his ranks, whatever it was. And then but there, was, there were no doctors in Pabianis ghetto, not a single one. And if there was one, they didn't want to be known. Uh, typhus, typhoid, 
broke out. And the, the first couple people that were sick with typhoid were transported to a Polish hospital. But if there was more and more, the Germans came to the Jewish community and they said, if you don't create your own hospital, within 48 hours, we'll liquidate the ghetto. Father was well known in the community from before, which is active in all kinds of activities. And uh, what he did is went to the homes of Bahurim, the, the young people from the synagogue, Orthodox, of course, and uh, with them, he went from door to door, picked up beds, all kinds from metal or wood, whatever you can spare, and bedding. And, uh, and there was an empty factory there where the Germans already removed the machinery from there. And uh, they whitewashed the inside. So within 24 hours, we had a working hospital with one person, my father. We, he asked for volunteers and there were more than we needed. And uh, women, grandwomen, grand, grandmothers, young women of all sorts came to volunteer to the hospital. It came a time when the Germans decided to liquidate the Fabianis ghetto. And uh, father thought that grandmother will be the safer under his supervision in the hospital than to stay with us. And mother and the two sisters and the younger brother and I went to the, what was at that time, the, the city uh, soccer field. And uh, there we were separated, men one side, women other side. And then when they grabbed away from my arm, my younger brother, who was seven years old at the time, and uh, that was the last I saw of him. We found that, or I found out later that they used the van, a closed van to shove in all the children in there and then diverted the exhaust fumes from the motor of the van, of the diesel into the van and then they dumped them in a ravine. They rinsed it out and came back for more. And I can still hear him today, screaming, I can't breathe. And so we were in ghetto also in one room it's a house, must have been several hundred years old. In the winter time, you couldn't close the windows because they were so warped. So we poured water on it so it should freeze this, the cracks in the window. And then I worked on a sewing machine for some reason. I've never touched a sewing machine before, but they trained me. So I worked about 12 hours a day and no food, one soup. There was a time that I, oh, by the way, that was when they liquidated the hospital in Pabianic ghetto. Father saw how they grabbed my grandmother, two 
SS people, one by the arms and one by the legs, and threw her out from the window into a truck that stood below them. And he never told that to mother until almost to the very end. Father died in Ghetto Lodge. Mother and I and the two sisters remained. Our carts were blocked because they wanted us to come to the, to the railroad station. So for three days we held off, not a crumb of food in the house, just water. And the mother, we left everything to mother, of course. She decided that either to die here in this old dilapidated house, the Germans offered you a loaf of bread when you come voluntarily to the station. So she decided we all go to the station. And, and before long, we were shoved into a cattle car, locked in, I don't know how many, hundreds, 120, I, don't, I have no idea how many. I only know that some people died. There were two, two buckets in the car. That's all, it's empty buckets for, for your needs. And people died. And, and some people had no choice but to sit on the corpses. Next thing we knew when they opened the doors, it was Auschwitz. I don't know how to tell you that, but we knew that we made the wrong decision. We should have stayed in maybe extinguish ourselves at that time before we went to the, to the railroad station. But that was too late. Immediately, schnell, schnell, kicking, hitting, barking dogs, some shootings, right on the spot, some older people asked the Germans something. So he took out the gun and shot him right on the spot. And so we knew what to expect. And then uh, we were transferred oh, by, by Dr. What's his name? Mengele. Mengele. He asked me, how old are you? I said, 18. So he put me to the adult men. How old were you actually? 14 and a half. And, and then we were transferred to another camp, another part of the camp, Sugoiner Lager, this is originally called. And uh, there, the people from the Todd Company made us stay half naked and they picked out people that they want to work for them. And the SS sold us to them so they can finance the Auschwitz activities. So the Todd company paid the SS for our work, for us, period. And, 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 and I came across a contract later on after liberation where the SS guaranteed that anyone that dies in camp or, or being removed from camp will be replaced with others. And they kept their word. Uh, I was 
I wanted to get out of Auschwitz, regardless what. There was young, a young fellow that was picked. I wasn't. Oh, yeah, by the way, the, the Todd guy also had a whip in his hand. And I know the handle was braided leather because I know very well because it hit me right across here. The reason was he asked me, how old are you? I said, 18. He hit me over the head. I fell down and he said, that will teach you not to tell a lie to a German officer. Uh, how old are you now? I said, 17. He hit me again. So I think I, 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 I fainted probably because somebody poured a pail of water on me. And I somehow, I don't know what happened. I think I had a, the expression on my face was, I, I was kind of a laughing at him. He came back and he figured that he didn't do enough, a good job. And he kept on hitting me with that handle of the whip. Uh, what happened was they separated a father from a son. And somebody asked, we were standing there. He asked, does anybody want to trade? And I said, I do. So I jumped over to the other side and we were shipped the same afternoon on a truck, it took about two hours to a branch of Auschwitz. It was, it's called the Gleiwitz, Gleiwitz IV. It was under the SS supervision with all the, with the Auschwitz rules in it. The last New Year's Day, we got a very high ranking SS officer replacing the commander. This one came from the Russian front. And he said something to the point that uh, you people can be happy. This year on the Jewish New Year's, we're not going to hang any Jewish prisoners. Big deal. Didn't do anything else, but that was it. Mickey, can you tell us a little bit about who the holy man of Auschwitz was and why I you will, called him I that? Will. Uh, how did I come to him? I was brought to him because I, I worked on construction and we brought water, a tank of water, on a farm wagon, really. And in the front was like a, 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 a two by four that steered the thing. There were no horses, but there were prisoners. I was one of them that wore a canvas band around my front shoulder and body. And I was pulling and two people in the hind were pushing. One assessment had also a whip with a very long leather end of it. He hit, oh, we were two in the front. He hit the fellow next to me on the legs and he pulled. So the, the leather wrapped, wrapped itself around the leg. And when he pulled, he fell. He fell on me and, and the wagon moved over into the ditch. And my knee happened to be just under that wheel, which was a wooden wheel with a steel rim. And it practically peeled all the skin off my skin from the knee. And I was brought, brought to the clinic. The clinic was exactly what you said. The, the, it used to be a broom closet. 
and and the the operating table was a slotted bench. The clinic had absolutely nothing medical in it. The doctor did not have a stethoscope. He had absolutely not a single aspirin even, not, no medicine, no creams, nothing of any sort. He had no, he had no surgical instruments. I said, you know something, I think I can help you with instruments. There was a custom that the, 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 the spoons which each one person got for, for the soup were made out of very cheap metal. And sometimes when you bent or were, you didn't pay attention to it, the handle broke off. And in order to get another spoon, you have to return this to the block leader. Block was the, 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 the barrack. And he gave you another spoon. The reason why they didn't want you to keep it because you could make a point out of it and use it as a weapon. And the doctor could get those handles. So sometimes I sharpened them. It depends what shape the end of this handle was, uh, either on, uh, on a piece of concrete or, 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 or later on a smooth stone to sharpen them. And he used it to people, it was winter time, in his, on that bench, to remove boils. There were pus, full of pus. They opened them, they removed it with his finger, with, with no gl gloves, with no instruments. I made- No anesthetic. Work. Absolutely not an aesthetic. Not only this, but not only the skin of, 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 of infected toes. He removed toes that were not, couldn't be saved anymore without anesthetics. I was the one who had to hold that patient down. And, and, and it was another one that was used to be a doctor. So he too was sitting on the other side on the legs or whatever it was to hold him in, in because people did not want to go to the clinic knowing that if Mengele comes, you're as good as a handful of ashes. You know, I think it's uh, remarkable that, uh, and something that we can all learn from, especially my medical colleagues who are listening, that uh, even when we are stripped of everything, all medicines, tools, that you can still provide care and, and that you remember this man as the holy man of Auschwitz who had nothing but his own personality and that really uh, healing and caring is about a personal connection with someone who cares for you. And I, I want to thank you how you saved my life twice, if I have the time. Go ahead. The first time, the first time uh, Mengele's visit, he didn't announce that he is coming, but uh, word goes around that he is coming and that he is going to, of course, be in the clinic. We had clinic about, what was it, four or five double bunk beds, at least two people to a bunk, and uh, maybe about 10 people or so, maximum. And uh, he knew what, what to expect for me. So he grabbed me, I didn't weigh very much. He grabbed me on his hand and deposited me in, in, a, in a barrack. A friend of his was the leader of this barrack. And, and when he came back, when, 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 when in, in, in 
And when Mengele left, he came back and picked me up again. His face was swollen. You could see the fingers on his face. This was one thing. The second part is the time when I was, I was lame. I was not anymore in the clinic. I worked. Uh, and, and Mengele, of course, marked me down as to my number, the same number that's tattooed on the arm. And that, is, that was about two hour drive to Auschwitz. So within two hours, I would have been a handful of ashes. No doubt about it. But what happened was he, he, the Schreiber, the Schreiber was the clerk, was also a German Jew. And he uh, wrote down my number, was a friend of the doctor. He exchanged two numbers, my number with a fellow who died the same day in camp. And I asked him, doctor, what can I do for you? And he said, very crisp, very short answer. He said, just pass it on. Be kind to the next fellow. He was, oh, the reason, he was a doctor in 44. He was from Hungary. He was in his 30s. I was a teenager. We didn't speak much. There wasn't much between us. But I knew that he was a doctor in an Air Force base in Hungary. And one day the, the cripple, the criminal police arrested him for a simple reason, his grandfather was Jewish and he ended up in Auschwitz. So, and when, and when the Russians came close to us, to Gleivis, which was Eastern Germany, they took us on a dead march. Half of us ended up in a ditch shot because couldn't walk fast enough. And we came to different camps on the way I don't know how many days we walked, three, four, I have no idea. There was no food, no water, but there was snow and ice that you could have that kept us alive. Uh, one night they took out 8,000 people. Well, there, there were other camps that concentrated in in one of the last camp was Blechhammer. Blechhammer was, they had some kind of a chemical factory built in a mountain, dug out in a mountain. People died there from the chemicals alone and they kept on replacing them. We were in a, in a barrack, our camp, and we did not move. They set up machine guns. The camps were thin, tiny, thin wood slats. And, and they set up in the machine, in the watchtowers, they set up machine guns. He kept on spraying the camp day and night. And we were about 2,000 people left alive 
when two Russian soldiers came in. There was a, there was a hole in, 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 in there was a wall around the camp, a 10 foot wall. And, and, and there was a hole in it, looks like a cannon shot or something like it, or whatever it was, we don't know. And people used to stick out their head to see what's on the other side. And there were Germans there with guns. Every time somebody stuck out their head, they shot him. So we had a lot of dead people around that hole. And and the, the two the two Russian soldiers that came in today is 70, 77 years that I saw the Russian soldiers. Two of them, they they didn't look like Russians, they looked more like Mongolian features. They probably saw plenty of death before they came to us, I'm sure. And at a height, apparently, I don't know where it came from, were 22,000 people there and 2,000 two, two, two alive. And Oh, the, the 8,000 that he took out were members also from our camp, from the Gleivitz camp. And uh, the engineer, well, I, I, I think, I think, Okay. I'm, I'm sure it's exhausting to tell that story. Um, I, I think that, first of all, I'd like to thank you for choosing to survive and uh, to honor the request of the holy man of Auschwitz and passing on the kindness and giving us today a personal um, a testimony to the impact of the efforts that Miriam described on the people who received some of these kindnesses and, and what a difference it made in their lives. And I'd like to thank all of you for uh, taking the time today to attend with us and to learn. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizations which made today possible, the Canadian Society for Yad Vashem, the Friends of the Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies, and of course, Sinai Health.